Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, a special uh, lecture here at the NOAA Central Library, uh, co-sponsored by Latinos at NOAA Employee Resource Group. We're very pleased to have uh, Car Axel Soderberg, uh, who uh, is, uh, has over 50 years of experience in the environmental protection field. He was the director of the Environmental Protection Agency's Caribbean Division for 20 years and is currently a member of the Board of Directors of the San Juan Bay Estuary Program and a member of the Advisory Council of AEDIS International, which um, you can see there on the slide. Uh, it's an a international sanitary engineer organization. Did I get yes. that right? Okay. Right. Um, I learned something today. He has been very active in assisting countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in the establishment of environmental control programs and capacity development. So uh, with uh, nothing further, uh, I'll uh, present you Carl Axel Soderberg. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, thanks uh, to Noah to allow me to give you this presentation here, which I think is very important. Uh, Danielle and Katie for setting this up. Thank you very much. And uh, I have here also a my friend from EPA, uh, Ms. Reyes, that has arranged uh, and coordinated my visit to DC for the whole week, uh, Janira Reyes. So thank you, Janira. Uh, I, I know that um, you have heard about Hurricane Maria and how it have affected Puerto Rico. Uh, it was covered worldwide and I'll show you, I think I showed you, but it doesn't move. Okay, here, the path through Puerto Rico. So as you see, it came in from the southeast and roughly came out in the northwest. It was a category four, not five, when it hit Puerto Rico, but the winds were 155 miles an hour. So that's the next, please. <laughs> maybe it, maybe I need to shoot it in a certain way. Uh, well, when I get there, anyway. Just give you a synopsis of the human devastation. All communications were gone, no internet, no cell phones. Land phone, land phones for a while. Uh, we lost water supply and I'll show you a graph on how we recovered. We could not recover 100% electricity until April of the next year. And that had an effect on many other aspects. As you see, more than half a million houses were damaged about 93,000 houses were completely destroyed. 80% of the crops were destroyed. And we had, to the best of that could be established, 3,000 deaths. So let me see if it moves now. Maybe, maybe, yeah, okay. This is the way that we recovered water supply. And I wanted to show you this because this has some public health implications. If you don't have any water, you cannot wash your hands. Uh, you cannot flush your toilet. And how are you gonna cook and, and the rest? But we did pretty well because by September 24, the hurricane hit September 24, the 20th. In four days, 80% of the population was without water. By the 1st of October, roughly half. But then one month later, 30% and so on, so roughly, in, in uh, December, we're in, we were in pretty good shape in terms of, of water. And remember, 
you need electricity in the potable drinking water plants, you need electricity in the pumping stations. So having, not having electricity was a real challenge, but the Puerto Rico Aqueducts and Sewer Authority rose to the occasion. Okay, the next one, Yanira, let's see if it works with you. Yeah, good. I'm not gonna talk about the human devastation in this presentation. It's the environmental impact. Okay, so we'll talk about the immediate impact, which means once the hurricane hit and maybe the first three months, the intermediate, which let's say it's two years afterwards, which is right now, roughly, and then the long-term impact. So going into the immediate impacts, 22 of the 51 sewage treatment plants were out of order for many reasons, lack of electricity, flooding, we had landslides. And the next slide. Because of that, water quality was degraded. Obviously, high fecal coliforms, a lot of nutrients, and we also had turbidity because we had rains of up to 40 inches in 24 hours. And that caused what I call a mud tsunamis. And that had other implications that we're going to talk about. In the beaches, well, eventually the rivers and streams get to the beaches. In Puerto Rico, it takes only 24 hours from the highest mountain top to the coastal areas. For, for that river to discharge. So all of those pollutants, including turbidity, got to the coast in less than 24 hours because the rain was really pouring. And also the beaches were cluttered with difficult to remove debris, like pieces of concrete, pieces of uh, metal. So people just couldn't go there and remove it you know, uh, two weeks later, you needed heavy equipment to do that. And we had a lot of beach erosion in a municipality called Barceloneta in the north coast. We used to have 80 feet of sand. Now we have four. That's the the, the strength of the of the hurricane strength. This is an article that says that in December, which is three months after, still the fecal coliforms were very high in the beaches around the San Juan area. So that meant that we Puerto Ricans that were very upset with what had happened, couldn't even go into the beach to relax because it was really polluted. The next one. Air quality. The air quality network was torn down by the winds, but luckily the, the only station that the medical science campus has at UPR in Centro Medico, for those that know, it's there to monitor the, the Sahara dust body measures all this stuff. So it measured very high levels of fungi. It's not surprising because of the humidity and a lot of soot, and you'll see why. As it's shown here, a lot of electric generators were imported to the island. In fact, EPA and the Puerto Rican government waived the air quality standards that these generators have to adhere to, and even Chinese generators got into Puerto Rico, which meant a lot of pollution. And the problem is that each house had one of these, each commerce had one of these. And I have to tell you that at night in my house, you could taste kerosene, or I mean diesel in your mouth. It was that bad. And besides that, I, I talked to some neighbors and they were like DC and that must have been a carbon monoxide. 
the next obviously the respiratory diseases spiked according to the puerto rico medical association the next one noise the same generators were very noisy so really at night you could not sleep <laughs> you could not breathe so it, it, it was terrible uh, the next one <clears throat> solid waste according to the caribbean division of epa that kept a tally on this 12 million cubic yards of debris was generated by the hurricane. 53% pertained to damage to structures and 47% trees and other vegetation. In addition, there was a lot of plastic bottles because there was no water. So they, you know, they ate from the continental US and other countries, bottled water. Also, you had to eat in, in plastic uh, dishes and whatever so a lot of solid waste were generated and according to EPA we had from the day of the of the hurricane four more years of capacity in the landfills two years have gone by nothing has been done about expanding landfills or other alternatives and the situation has grown worse, which will, I will explain in the next section. The next, please. Trees. To me, this is the worst environmental damage. According to the International Tropical Forestry uh, Institute of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forestry, 144 million trees were uprooted. Can you imagine? According to the Puerto Rico uh, Department of Natural and Environmental Resources, 98% of the mature trees in the forest, which they manage because they are federal forests too, were uprooted. And 70% of the trees were defoliated. So basically, we had no tree coverage. And that's why we got a mud tsunami with those intense rains. Because by the way, the rains did not stop after Maria left. We got rains for at least two months after, heavy rains. So the next one. <clears throat> Chapata, coral reefs, uh, one, Two more. <laughs> uh, here. according to NOAA, 11% were destroyed. The next one, it also affected endangered species. I'm just going to mention four, because if not, we'll be here the rest of the afternoon. Let's start with the plants. This is called Yerba Maricao de la Cueva. Maricao is a municipality in the western part of Puerto Rico. This plant only is found there. And according to Fish and Wildlife, 80% was wiped out. The next one, this orchid is found in El Yunque National Forest. For us, El Yunque is like a holy place. And uh, a lot of trees were uprooted. And according again to uh, Fish and Wildlife, this orchid suffered devastation too. It wasn't wiped out, but you know, a lot of it was destroyed. And the next one, this is a, a, like a small hawk only found in Puerto Rico in a certain area where Janira leaves <laughs> in La Juntas, in that area. So out of the 75 that we had, we only have now 19. 
The next one, please. 24% of the nests of the hawksbill turtle were wiped out. And the next one, the Puerto Rican parrot, which is very emblematic for us. It's, it's not officially the national bird of Puerto Rico, but everybody looks uh, to it. In the Junque National Forest of 53 parrots living in the wild, only three survived. In the Rio Abajo Forest in Arecibo of 140, 90, that's not that bad. In Maricao, the number is not here. We had 31, all were wiped out. But we also have parrots in captivity that saved the day. And in El Junque, there is a bunker, which I have visited, that I'm telling you, it withstands not only a category five, but a category six whenever we go up hurricane. We will, but, and staff remain with the parrots, the, you know, the parrots in captivity there, but we don't have that bunker in Arecibo or here. So that needs to be built. And I have to tell you that in spite of the fact that we haven't gotten most of the relief funds yet for the parrots, we got $11 million quickly to help them out. And in this summer, some of the uh, new pirates were put in the wild. So we cannot celebrate because we have a, a long-term effect that I'll tell you about now, but this is the, the immediate impact, okay? The next one. Well, we also have non-native species like this pretty bird here, Obispo Rojo, which is the red bishop, and all were wiped out. They live in the northern part of Puerto Rico. 80% of the bees were wiped out. So you can imagine the impact on agriculture. We need the bees to uh, pollinate. Marine organisms, my guess, but you're the experts, because of the impact on the coral reefs, the, the population of lobster, octopus, and conch were greatly reduced. The next one. So th those were like the immediate impacts. Now we're talking about the intermediate impacts. Maria is responsible for water rationing. You're going to ask me, you're crazy. How can that happen in 2019, two years later? Well, Maria damaged the dam of a reservoir. And to avoid a complete collapse, you have to put down the level of water and reduce it to 40%. And the dam was not a, come on, fixed until about a month ago. So we had a drought early in 2019. And because we didn't have enough reserves in that reservoir, 200,000 people had to be subjected to water rationing, one day with water, one day without water for three months. And, and the root cause was Maria. The next one. We are still vulnerable to landslides because of the lack of tree cover. So what that ha you know causes, water supply intakes are are clogged. So you have to stop the supply of water in certain areas. For instance, when Dorian passed by Puerto Rico, it didn't hit Puerto Rico, thanks God. And it was also a, a tropical storm, not a hurricane. But the rain was enough to prompt all of the drinking water plants in the eastern part of the island to stop delivering water. 
because some of the intakes were clogged and, and some, the turbidity was very high and the plant could not handle that. Also, sometimes these uh, landslides will destroy the water distribution lines and also the sanitary sewers, which then cause water pollution. The next one. This is why the parrots are not off the hook because of the lack of canopy. They cannot hide from the hawks like the Guarawao. So I told you that we had three. We lost one to the Puerto Rican hawk. And uh, so for a time we had two until we, we uh, let out the, the new seedlings. The other problem with a small Puerto Rican hawk is that out of the 21 trees where they nest, we lost 18. And trees cannot be grown overnight. So something has to be done with that. And also because of the lack of, or because of the beach erosion that continues to this day for other reasons, the nesting of sea turtles have gone down in Puerto Rico. Coral reefs, again, because of the lack of trees, we still get a lot of sediments. And as you might know here, no, especially sediments are poison to coral reefs. So the point is, and you have given money to grow coral reefs, and that that, uh, uh, that was, I, I think it was developed in Puerto Rico by some Puerto Rican scientists. But if you don't resolve this, we, we have uh, going to get more coral die off because it's not only the sediment and we have climate change. Uh, high temperatures, acidity, even the Sahara dust has been established to, to impact coral reefs. So all of that together doesn't bode well for coral reefs. The next one. The marine organisms, we still have problems with the three species. Next one. Solid wastes, okay. Now we have to demolish. 16,000 structures. If that debris has to go to the landfills, we'll lose one more year. And we'll have one more year left to deal with garbage in Puerto Rico. The next one. And water pollution, this is like a side effect. Maria, because of flooding in the uh, west, most part of the island affected a, a very large trunk sewer. Uh, and somehow the trunk sewer, which is underground, got all bent up out of shape and, and a, a lot of sewer switch overflow was occurring. So that had to be replaced at the cost of $50 million on an emergency basis. The next one. That's the article that explains that. The next one. So also, every time we have torrential rains, we're in the tropics, so we do get torrential rains. We're getting more sediments into our reservoirs. And, and just to explain a little bit, uh, the president of the Puerto Rican Aqueduct and Sewer Authority estimates that Maria itself uh, caused a 10% reduction in our capacity to store water in the reservoirs. My estimate is 20%. To date, two years afterwards, the studies have not been done to determine exactly the impact. 
But before Maria, one of the reservoirs that provides 50% uh, of the water to the San Juan metro area was 50% filled with sediment. And another one, Dos Bocas in Arecibo, which supplies about a third of the water to the metro area, was filled to 63%. So even a 10% increase, which is a conservative uh, estimate, would be bad for Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and, and the other reservoirs were impacted too. So now we go to the long-term impacts. Let's begin with one. We will continue to have a reduction in, in water storage capacity in our reservoirs. Every time that we have a torrential rain, we'll have erosion and sediment, sediments will flow into the reservoirs at a higher rate than before Maria, because in Maria we had a forest cover, which dampens the impact of water. The next one. We will have an increase in the frequency of water supply outages, because for the same reason, we have very high turbidity levels that cannot be handled by the treatment plants. And to protect our health, then the utility has to stop the supply of water until the turbidity comes down. The next one. When you have turbidity, you increase the chance that these pathogens that you're seeing on the board, Cryptosporidium and Cyclospora, which are immune to chlorine, when I went to the university, they said, if you disinfect water, that's it. You can drink it. The pathogens will die. That's no longer the truth. We have some pathogens that are resistant to chlorine. And the way to get them out of the water is through very, a very high level of filtration. And the way that EPA monitors that is through the level of turbidity in the water. And according to EPA, you cannot exceed 0.3 NTUs in the water that comes out of the filter, of each filter in each drinking water plant. So, and that's a very difficult level to achieve. So if you get any kind of turbidity, these pathogens can slip into the uh, distribution system and be a, a health menace. The next one, coral reefs. We continue to have sediments flowing to the coastal areas after heavy rain. So we will have a higher rate of coral die-off. The next one. And because of the increase of runoff, we will have some sewer overflows. We will have a also septic tank overflows. And we'll have a greater amount of pathogens in the coastal waters, the next one, which lead to closure of beaches. And uh, Puerto Rico is in dire straits economically too. And one of the areas that was identified as helping to quickly recover economically was tourism. But if we have beaches, that do not meet the standards, what are we doing? So the next one. So all of these long-term effects can be addressed if we implement a very aggressive reforestation program. It has to be like a Marshall Plan. Right now, 
what we're getting is only a hundred thousand trees per year for the next five years, which is a half a million trees. When you consider it that the hurricane uprooted 144 million trees, you do the math. Our grandchildren of our grandchildren will not see that. And the reason I'm in the Washington area speaking to you and EPA and a lot of other people is that we need to get, which is the next one, to get the restoration of the green infrastructure to be part of Puerto Rico's reconstruction, because that's currently not in the plans. And this is the end of my presentation, and I will gladly entertain any questions that you have. Does anyone in the room have any questions? Photo. Yes, Ooh, lots of questions. OK, we'll start over here. Oh, OK. So I, I, I'm, I'm just amazed, blown because I, I hadn't appreciated how bad the, the wire impact was. Uh, Georges uh, brought that out really radically, Hurricane Georges, right? And uh, uh, where I believe in there were communities that were without water for a very, very long time. In fact, it seemed that the water, the vulnerability of the water system there was almost as bad as the electrical. But that's, uh, so what hasn't happened that uh, in between one you know, hurricane and the other, right? I mean, I would have thought that there would have been mitigation efforts what, what was missed that, that needed to be done or that was you know, expected? But in, in terms of the of the human devastation or what? Well, in terms of the water system. Ah, the water systems. Okay. One of the things that changed, in my opinion, is that EPA forced the utility to have generators in each of the plants and also in some key pumping stations. But you have to remember that before Maria, we had Irma, which was a category five. It missed Puerto Rico by, I think, 75 miles, but it hit the Northeast coast. But I say this because a lot of diesel was used because you know electricity went off and all of the supplies from the continental us were stopped and that's the usual uh, plan they don't want to damage ships until they say maybe a, a week afterwards that they say the harbor is safe and whatever so we had taken a blow before not a huge blow like this one so the, the levels of fuel went down, and at the time, there was no fuel. And you have to realize that when priorities were given out for generators, the first priority were the hospitals. And we have 58, I believe, or something. I say 60. And then, obviously, uh, the drinking water part, not the sewage part, and, and so on. And, and then after you got them, you had to fight for the fuel. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we, we were not prepared to this level of a hurricane. They say that uh, San Felipe, that occurred in 1928, was a Cat 5. And we had no experience with a Cat 5 until Maria. Uh, and Maria really was four. <laughs> yeah. So what could be done? Now they see that some of the uh, drinking water plants or sewage treatment plants were flooded. So now they want to change it to, to a place where it's not flooded. So maybe that, that will help, but the money hasn't arrived to do that. Hi, you're talking about the, the generators and the diesel uh, fuel. 
two-part question. How long did that go on? How many months did that continue before? Until April. Okay. Of 2018. And as far as the landfills go, I've never been in a location that got hit bad by a hurricane that they didn't start, uh, that they weren't overwhelmed by the, by the trash, so they just burn it. So was there a lot of burning going on? And if so, what did that do to the air pollution as, as well? Yeah, the question is, it, the Puerto Rican government did not allow the burning. So we still have some piles of debris around with other types of problems like rats. And what will eventually be done, we don't know. Because you can imagine 144 million trees. Some of the trees like teak and whatever, they were sold. But I would say that three quarters of that is still lying there. And we don't know what to do with that. What? They, those trees come back. Are they, the El Yonke is starting again. Yeah, but the thing is that that uh, vines are starting to get into the picture, and then vines inhibit the growth of the trees that should be coming up. And in El Yonke, they're even thinking, God forbid, of using pesticides to deal with the vines. Can you imagine? They're desperate. <laughs> I'm Hi. not leaving, so I'll answer all questions. Could you talk a little bit about why or what barriers you've had to getting green infrastructure included in the governor's recovery plan and maybe why um, trees aren't being funded in greater numbers? I know um, we've been working on the coral aspects here at NOAA, and we've also had barriers getting coral reef and natural infrastructure put into the planning and getting funding. So I'm just wondering um, if you've seen similar problems or what you've been encountering. I, I think that the, the human devastation was so great that uh, government officials, both at the federal level and the local level, are, are saying that's the priority, but they're not seeing the long-term effects of many of these things that will impact also human beings. It's a, it's a lack of knowledge, maybe, also. And, and that's, we're trying to open eyes that, listen, to begin with, with the coral reefs, I was told in a, in a briefing session that coral reefs uh, to the north of San Juan reduced the force if that's of waves during Maria by 70% or something. How many? 90% 90. 90 better still. Those of you which are who are Puerto Ricans, you know the, uh, the Ocean Park area. That waves came in all the way to Casalta. Can you imagine if we didn't have the coral reefs? They would go all the way to the Valdoriotti de Castro Avenue, the avenue that goes to the airport. So I think that's the way to sell to the FEMA people and to the, the Puerto Rican government. Now listen, if you don't take care of the coral reefs, no, it's not only the fishes and the lobsters and the conch and the octopus, it's we people. Um, I think, first of all, thank you. It's an excellent uh, uh, presentation. Um, I think you said a very key expression about root cause. There's a lot of root cause that are not being addressed. And something that probably will be great if we can get the people on the government. And I'm just, it's not a question, but it's just a suggestion because you may be able to interact better with them. It is, for example, take some of the ideas of ecosystem evaluation that Doug Lipton from NOAA has developed and have for many years and show the people in the world the value of these ecosystem services that they may not see 
the value of having some forests around the uh, reservoir in terms of the co lower cost of purification of the water versus the money they will get if they just make houses and get it from there. Right now, politics works by money. We have to show, and if we, we don't show the value of this ecosystem uh, services provided by the coral reef, provided by the green vegetation, provided by uh, the bees, nothing's going to happen. So somehow in this conversation, we need to, and for any one of you who has those numbers, they can provide and share it. I'll give you a number. Yeah. In terms of the reservoirs, dredging of the Carraiso Reservoir will cost at least 150 million. And the Dos Bocas, which is a bigger one, at least 400 million. FEMA has been asked for the money. I don't know if they will give it or not, but even if they give the money, if you don't take care of the trees, you'll get the same problem in 10 years or less. And there, and, and the Puerto Rican government doesn't have that money to be dredging every 10 years or whatever. So I think that's a way to, and, and if you don't serve water to the people, we'll get another revolution. I'm telling you. Yeah. I would like to uh, Mira, talk oh, so that sorry. the people. Yes. Hi, I'm Janira from EPA. Okay. Um, so we've actually been uh, making the rounds with Dr. Soderberg, trying to raise the alarm about this issue. So now that you mentioned this, I would like to encourage you all who might have information, you know, regarding Puerto Rico and the different types of impact and numbers, if you can share that with us or concerns like this, because uh, we're actually trying to get uh, Mr. Soderbergh in front of Congress next year, perhaps by April. So if we can get better numbers, the cost of certain um, things, the cost to human quality of life or to the environment in the long term, that'd be great. So I would encourage you to contact us and, uh, and share that information with us. Or to join the group, as Noah, join the group, yes. that would be better. <laughs> I, think, I think what uh, Dr. Olivier says is uh, very key is very critical because uh but i think you should not only say how much it costs to do the dredging but you should also say how much it would cost to not do the dredging. no no well it's the other that's yeah, the most right. important part because not doing the dredging is what's going to cost you more in the long run that's yeah. that's basically all i have but we have a we have a um a economist that have been talking to janira that has gone into the environmental cost and benefits. And when we had this very severe drought in 2015, you know, everybody was complaining in the newspapers, like the utility was crying because, oh, we had to, to spend about, it cost us $70 million, including the seeding of the clouds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the infamous, there. yeah. Um, then agriculture, it cost us, I don't know, I'm making up the number 50 million, which is nothing. But it, this doctor in economics did the study, you know how, how much it costs to the Puerto Rican people like you and I? One billion dollars. And he went, yeah, because you have to get water. You had to, you, you know, it, somebody had to stay with their kids and not go to work. The, the, I mean, the schools, when they, they had to close at 12 o'clock. So, and then, so, and, you know, and so on, and you had to buy things for home, and he calculated that. So, I think it goes in the direction you're talking about. If, if we don't do anything about the reservoirs, we are going to have droughts, artificial droughts. For those of you who are not sure, we can, uh, when he says that somebody had to stay home with their kids, what he's referring to is that there was no um, water, there was no tap water, therefore somebody had to go out and get uh, bottled water, but there was no bottled water in the stores either. So people were, were crazy going in from one place to the next, to uh, NGOs, churches, anywhere where they heard, uh, that water may be given away that day. 
So it was actually a survival mode for most Puerto Ricans, um, especially outside of San Juan. San Juan pretty much got into normal strife fairly quickly, but the rest of the island did not. Actually, it caused, it caused death uh, because uh, there were a lot of people taking water from, str uh, from streams. Yeah. And they were, uh, they never declared it to the best of my knowledge. But, and I cannot, I always kill it, leptos. Leptospirosis. Thank you. There was uh, what would be considered by numbers an epidemic of leptospirosis because people were just drinking water for streams. From whatever. Yes. From whatever. And there were multiple, multiple deaths. Um, actually, they think that a lot of the deaths associated after Maria, the 3,000, were probably the hundreds. No, not, but, but anyway, Janira, I live in the metro area, and the, the, the rationing got so bad that we had no tap water for three consecutive days. And then you got water one day allegedly, but it wasn't 24 hours because by the time the water pressure went up and then they took it off. And we were heading on not having water for six consecutive days, can you imagine? So I think it was worse than South Africa that was really published about two years ago. Well, let me see if they have questions. And hi, thank hi, you. I'm thank sorry you. that we oh, no, it's okay. were discussing all this stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if you could kind of talk about the coastal restoration efforts that are in the planning, if there are plans for that to kind of um, build up the shoreline for future storms and to better prepare in the future. The answer is that I haven't heard any plans. I do know that the studies have been made to show where the impacts are and where no new buildings should be built and permits are being given as we speak for for buildings to be built there incredible and as far as i know there is no government effort to move people in the vulnerable areas more inland so i guess the answer is no Kind of create like a multiple lines of defense model um, along the coast? No, that that I know of. I do know that Noah gave, I think, um, you know, five million dollars for the coral reefs or something. I, I, that's what I heard. So what I know is that um, Noah was involved in leading the um, coastal working groups for FEMA to help write into the governor's recovery plan different pieces for coral restoration, mangroves, sand dunes, and all of that. So that's, it, it is in the governor's recovery plan. Whether or not it gets funded is still in question. Um, there were a number of assessments that were done. There was some immediate funding that came from different partners, TNC, NIFWIF, um, from FEMA that did coral restoration and triage immediately after, as well as various assessments. Um, one of the challenges that we have had is the some of the barriers we've had is within FEMA's, um, it's in the legislation itself within the public assistance funding, which is the majority of funding. And unless something has been a maintained infrastructure, then it doesn't necessarily qualify for recovery funds. So one of the struggles we're having is how do you get some of this funding to actually put in place um, coral restoration when there's not policy within FEMA that supports green infrastructure and when you get these decisions from FEMA saying that this is not considered a maintained facility um, maybe because it hasn't had coral restoration before or you haven't done assessments on it. And so the majority of the corals would not therefore be applicable for this money. There may be other ways to get around it by saying, oh, well, this coral protects this public building behind it. 
but the the granularity that FEMA works on is different than how NOAA works at more of this landscape scale, whereas FEMA looks at we have this not this infrastructure here that has to be public. You know, is this a public infrastructure, a public road, a hospital, something like that that this um, natural infrastructure would then protect? So it's trying to figure out how to work within that construct of the limitations on the funding that's written into legislation. Um, I know that the new DRRA Act that was signed in 2018 is going to put 6% of all federal declared disaster money towards pre-disaster mitigation, which may help to some extent. Um, what I'm not sure is how much that limitation for public assistance dollars will continue onto that money and whether or not that will um, be able to be something used for these larger natural infrastructure projects or if that's going to mean if it's going to still be a continuing barrier so i people are working on it but it's it's a nut that hasn't been cracked yet um, coming what you coming regarding what you said it is uh thinking about infrastructure and if i understood clearly well this is an this is not a house or this is not a bridge therefore the reef doesn't qualify but then we are defining infrastructure as a man-made can we redefine, well, the forest or the infrastructure that sustain the area? Or if in the case of the coral reef, if I already have a project that is already, uh, like the work that uh, Edwin, or Dr. Hernandez uh, does in Puerto Rico is growing co pieces of coral. Well, I'm growing that piece of coral if that's the that situation. Well, that's an infrastructure. And then justify, I am growing that coral and therefore, if that's the need to be, a, you know, if we need our homo sapiens to be doing something, well. That's, that's the requirement. It's, it's the man-made infrastructure along with maintenance. So if you had a beach that's had nourishment in the past, that can qualify for infrastructure. But if you have a beach that's not ever had the nourishment, that's not infrastructure. Uh, we need so to talk with our. That, that, that's, that's a criteria. And then you also come into jurisdiction and who owns it. So for any for example, El Yunque is a national forest, so FEMA can't fund reforestation on that because that has to come from the National Park Service, not from FEMA dollars. So there's also these um, intricacies that come in jurisdiction. <clears throat> but that's, that's, that actually is a, a perfect example when we talk to the leaders of the Congress. It says, hey, can we, you know, just align on the law. Can we, you know, just yeah. make this line in which the definition, what is the definition of infrastructure? And just by redefining that, that what it is, not a man-made, but going back to the ecological services, if it's, it's having that sand dune, it's protecting my shoreline from flooding, I will call that a natural piece of infrastructure, which is part of the natural resources. And therefore it will be okay. I don't know. But this is the type of situation okay, that your talk. Yes help Wait. us understand because i was not aware of that just 20 minutes ago so thank you questions <laughs> I, I follow up yeah so what a way to get around like a, a way to get around that could be oyster reefs um that's something that is done in louisiana um, that was devastated by Hurricane Katrina. Um, and that has been one of the big efforts is kind of armoring the shoreline, um, you know, creating these reefs. Um, there's tons of NGOs and nonprofits that are um, on the ground working on these issues um, and combining that with planting trees, wetlands, all of that. Um, is that something, I'm not sure of the, the ecosystem down there and if oyster reefs would, would survive, um, if that is a possibility, but just throwing that out there. It's certainly a possibility. Thank you. Uh, I was just curious about the sedimentation problem in the reservoirs. Is the uh, Corps of Engineers uh, <clears throat> working on that to try to have constant removal so they could <clears throat> increase the capacity of the reservoirs? Are they, or are they not? No, at least not yet. Any hand? 
So you, you, this may be an unfair question, but but I'm very tempted to ask because you may have a bird's eye view, having uh, given your your history and background. Um, is Puerto Rico, you know, so if we had a movable Cat Five and go for it, we ever did that. I mean, is Puerto Rico the worst case, the best case in terms of resilience uh, to to uh, intense uh, storms like that in the Caribbean region? I don't think we've ever had in the U.S. in the, uh, the situation where a tropical cyclone just really knocked down the power grids and other, I mean, water, uh, it, to the extent that it happened in Puerto Rico. So, uh, so uh, do you have a sense of that? I mean, uh, uh, how do we compare? I mean, we know that the, the other islands have suffered, you know, terrible damage. Uh, but are we, is, is, is the infrastructure resiliency is that what we can expect from the other islands, for example, if we if they had a similar experience? Well, I, I do know that the island of Dominica was struck about maybe five years ago, six years ago, and it was caused a lot of death and whatever. And they recovered, but you have to take in, into consideration the population of Dominica. I don't think it's more than 20,000. Puerto Rico's population right now is about 3.4 million. So it's a difference in scale. Maybe you can quickly give aid and push back a small island via via a bigger island. Um, so, um, one thing to take into consideration in, in your statement is on the mainland, you have an infrastructure in place that would not get damaged and you can get goods and services in. You can truck them in, you can train them in, whatever. You know, uh, Puerto Rico, not so. So the the time and the cost to get the same services that you would on the mainland. So I like the comments that the gentleman had about the uh, doing the cost studies. I think it's excellent comments. I would go one step further because when you come to Washington, D.C., some people will listen to you because they care or they are <coughs> human. <Yeah. laughs> some will not listen unless you show them what it costs them. So I would go not only with their suggestions as to the cost if you do something, if you don't, but I would go one step further and show what it costs the U.S. mainland taxpayer in their dollars, if you don't put X amount of dollars in for these specific things in Puerto Rico, what does it mean to the person here? Because Puerto Rico may be a place they've never been to. They probably couldn't even find it on a globe. Mm -hmm. They don't care. Mm -hmm. So you got to make it something they care about. And when they're talking about your wallet in D.C., then people will listen to you. Thank you. I had a comment regarding to that, and thank you because you brought an idea. Um, after Maria, a big situation that happened in Puerto Rico, that's where I, I think where a lot of the uh, ID, medical equipment, specifically like ID bags, yeah. some of the major supply in the whole of the nation are made in Puerto Rico. So suddenly, when those pharmaceuticals that made that supply, that product, that a very specific product, was functioning so far, there were surgeries being delayed in the states because they were not getting the the IV equipment needed for them, and they had to triage everything. So that's a good point. I never thought about that uh, that angle. Yeah, thank you. That's another one that is good. So any other question? Yeah, yeah sure. No, I, I lived there for a long time, and one of my favorite things about living there was your kind of coffee. Yeah, so gonna. How much they were well, the, the answer, no, no, the answer is, no, no, the answer is that we have no native grown coffee and it takes four years to plant a coffee plant and to have it to give the bean. So for four years, we have to import coffee from other countries until we regrow that. It takes four years. Plantations, yeah. My colleague here was a forecaster in Puerto Rico. I see, good. Yeah. Well, uh, well. 
never have another cup of Nutella coffee. It doesn't sit well. I can get. Uh, no, no, we'll get you <laughs> some. We'll get you some. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Soderberg. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone, online. Um, there were some questions online, but I will just send them to you, and Fine. you can answer them offline. So. Sure. Thank you, everyone, yeah, for coming. I, uh, yeah. say one more thing? Thanks to the library for hosting us. Oh, yes. And uh, we're case. all federal people, or we're federal people. We know the value of a piece of paper, and so we have a certificate of appreciation, oh, courtesy <laughs> that's uh, enabled by the Office of uh, Inclusion and Civil Rights, of which we collaborate with. Here at uh, Noah. Let's have a picture. And we get a picture <laughs> for the record. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. And thank you for something, something to talk about. Thank Thanks you for all. all your help. Thank you.